ladies, gentlemen. For the work I'm doing, I went to the wrong school and the wrong college. <laughs> I went to a very strange school called the Doom School, an even stranger college called St. Stephen's College. And in my previous life, I was also the national sports champion. So the world was at my feet. I could do nothing wrong. And all the jobs were waiting. And then out of sheer curiosity, I said I'd like to see what a village is like. Never been to a village. I only heard about it second hand. So I then went to a village, and at that time, Jay Prakash Narayan had appealed to the young people in 1965 to go to the famine in Bihar. I thought I'd go to this famine in Bihar. I went to the friend called Suman Dube, who was a friend of Rajiv Gandhi, and we all went and saw the famine in Bihar. It shook, my, shook me because never seen hunger, never seen starvation, never seen deaths in front of your eyes. It was an absolute traumatic experience. <coughs> Went back home. I told my mother, I think I'd like to live and work in a village. <coughs> mother went into a coma. She said, what is this? Everything is laid out for you. Jobs are waiting for you. And all of a sudden you want to go to this village? Oh, no. no money, no job, no prospects. What is this? What are you going to do? I said, I'd like to be an unskilled laborer digging wells will not speak to me for many years because she thought I'd let the family down. But for five years, I dug wells in Rajasthan looking for water and I was exposed to the most extraordinary knowledge and skills that very poor people have. Absolutely extraordinary. You don't read about it in college, you don't read about it in books or universities. You just have to feel that knowledge and skill. And I thought then, why don't I start a barefoot college only for the poor? What the poor thought was important would be reflected in this college. So I went to this village called Tilonia because my master trainer came from this village called Tilonia. I had no idea I was going to be there for 40 years. I just thought I couldn't visit it. So the people came and said, uh, are you running from the police? I said, no. You failed in your exam. I said no. You didn't get a government job. I said no. What are you doing? Is there something wrong with you? You go to a school and college like that and you want to come back to a village? Are you running from something? You see, unfortunately, the education system here does not prepare you for going to a village. If you go to a village today, it's a punishment. You are a failure if you go to a village. So we wanted to change that mindset. So I started the Barefoot College in 1971. And we redefined professionalism just because of the exposure we had. <coughs> who is a professional today? A professional is someone who has a combination of competence, confidence, and belief. A water diviner, for me, is a professional. A traditional midwife is a professional. A traditional bone setter is a professional. All these people are highly respected, very well applied, very well received, but they don't feature in what we call professionalism. So we wanted to bring all these people into the college and show that they could also be a part of Main Street. It's 500 miles southwest of Delhi. It's a very small village. What I learned from the community was that there's a difference between literacy and education. We always insult people when we say this man is uneducated. No one today in India can be called uneducated. Actually, what you're trying to say is that he doesn't know how to read and write. Never confuse the two. So, I like the next quotation, which is very good. It actually applies to the barefoot problem. The illiterate of the 21st century not be someone who can't read and write. 
for someone who is not prepared to learn, unlearn, and relearn. They said, okay, you're talking like this, show, show me on the ground what you mean. So we built the Barefoot College in 1986. He's the first barefoot architect. He can't read and write. He drew the drawings on the sand for me and built me the college at $1.50 a square foot. In two years. When we came to the roof, we went to the forester, government forester, and said, what should we plant here? He looked at the ground, hard rock, no um, water. He said, nothing will grow. And then I went to the local old man in the village and said, what should I plant? He said, you plant this and this and this and this is what the new day looks like today. Went to the roof. All the women said, now all the men clear out because we don't want to share this technology with the men. There's a certain type of technology that they use with a bit of urine, with a bit of cow dung, with a bit of mixture or whatever, we don't know, but it was waterproof, it does not leak today, it is rural technology at its best. And today we have a barefoot college which is 150 people live and work there and it's the technology base for serving over 100,000 people with basic needs. What is the college about? It is a college where we have a, a, a place where people can look at, uh, at performances uh, and under where they are sitting is an underground rainwater harvesting tank. We don't allow one drop of water to be wasted in the campus. That's a 400,000 litre tank that they are sitting on and we are self-sufficient in water even if there is a because we collect rainwater. It's the only college in India, which at the rural areas at least, which is optical fiber cable connected. It has a speed post service. You should buy Kilonia handicaps within seven days anywhere in the world from this little itsy bitsy piece of post office. It reaches you, all your handicap titles. And it is the only college which is fully solar energized. We have 100 kilowatts of panels on the roof and solar power meets all our needs. It's a college which has a community <coughs> radio. We reach 50,000 people through all our programs through the community radio. And we believe that services should be provided whenever possible. And it should also extend to services that are very expensive outside the village. So we have a barefoot dentist. This is a grandmother who's been trained to be a dentist. She looks after the teeth of 7,000 children. And if trained properly, one day, inshallah, with Italian help, they'll be able to perform a root canal. We have four acupuncturists with an alternative health. We have a laboratory, physically challenged who are barefoot pathologists. <coughs> test samples, blood, urine, at 10 rupees when in the city it costs about 500. We, have, we ran, ran a school in the morning for 500 children and they all learn about more about the village <coughs> rather than about the national curriculum. This is our first barefoot solar engineer. She is a priest in a nearby temple but he has solar rectified the whole campus today and with that power, you look after 350 fans, lights, computers, labs, temperature, deep freeze, audiovisual equipment. So we are self-sufficient in water and we are self-sufficient in power, so long as the sun shines. We have a 40,000 book library, we have an administrative block and an open space for protest. And this one is decentralized so that if any power plant should go out of action, all the other four are still working. So the whole philosophy of the Barefoot College demystified and decentralized. That is the key to sustainability today. It has also got Wi-Fi hotspots, so we are already in the 21st century, all solar operating. If you should come to Colonia, 
you will get solar cooked food. 60 people twice a day, we get cooked solar cooked food. But it is actually fabricated in Kelowna itself. And these are illiterate women making these solar water, solar cookers. They actually fabricate the clock, and the clock moves the, solar, the cooker with the sun. And this clock is fabricated by the grandmothers in Polonia itself. They are almost, unfortunately, half German because they are so precise. <laughs> they do the welding on their own, and this is the solar cooker that we <coughs> cook meals in our mess. 1975, we did a survey of education in our village and we found 60% of the children don't go to school in the morning because they are, they are associated with domestic chores and in the morning they have to look for wood, they have water. So why didn't we start a school for the convenience of the, of the child rather than for the teacher? So we started the first night schools of Telonia in 1975 and they were all with solar lanterns but today, in 2012, we have 150 night schools, all solar lit, all with light and the night. Today, 7,000 children are actually going to these 150 night schools. But the beauty is that every three years, all these children between 6 and 14 have an election. And they elect a prime minister. The Prime Minister today is 12 years old. She looks after 20 goats in the morning, but she's Prime Minister in the evening. She is voted in by 7,000 children, and there's a children's parliament, which actually monitors, supervises, and administers the 7,000 children in the 150 schools. This is the cabinet, very powerful, very hard. If the Prime Minister should write to me saying the teacher is misbehaving, he's misusing the solar lantern, not coming in time, beating the child. That teacher is fired because the cabinet is a very serious process and all the children decide on how to run the school. These are the four, five. Out of the 7,000 children, 60% are girls. So to the much to the regret of all the boys, all the prime ministers are girls. The boys have to settle for Speaker of the House, we don't like it, but all these girls are very powerful, very strong, very communicative, no nonsense that One of them, five years ago, when she <coughs> get the World Students Prize from the Queen of Sweden, the Queen of Sweden just couldn't believe that this girl who had never been outside a village in her life, was handling Sweden as if she'd been born there, and she couldn't manage, she turned to me and said, Please ask this girl, never been outside a village in her life. How does, how, where does she get her confidence from? So this girl on her left looked at the queen straight in the eye and said, please tell her I'm the prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> Wherever the standard of illiteracy is very high, we believe in puppetry. Puppets is the way to communicate where there's no television, where there's no newspapers. And this man is Joachim Chacha. He is 300 years old, he's a Muslim. He knows the gossip of all the village. He is my psychoanalyst, he's my doctor, he's my lawyer, he's my teacher, he's my donor. If I should have to raise some money, I get Joachim Chacha. If there's a dispute in the village between the teacher and the child and the attendance goes down, I get Joachim Chacha to come and uh, solve my problems, so he's an invaluable asset, he's a legend in our area, and we make the puppets there. Most of these puppets are made out of recycled World Bank reports. <laughs> Actually, one of them was given to the Vice President of World Bank. So. <laughs> So over 100,000 people actually watch these puppet shows which are through solar lanterns. And, have, and we talk about why you should send your child to school, why you should have safe little water. Usually puppetry in Rajasthan is, is connected to kings and queens and you have the string puppets where only 50 people can watch. With the club puppets, over 5,000 people can watch so you can reach many more people. So it's a very major program for us how we 
go to these villages and talk about it. It's interactive. So you can stop the puppet and say, look, what do I do if my wife is pregnant? No, the puppet should tell them, go to the doctor. This is the best person. So they're also an information channel, interactive. Rainwater harvesting. 300 years of Rajasthan desert. Rainwater harvesting is to the heart. Look how beautiful some of these are. They're still running, they're still working, you still collect rainwater. And so this technology, which already exists, we wanted to replicate by bringing that technology into the schools. So now there are over 1,200 schools where we collect over 100 million liters of rainwater. And this is one way of making sure that the child comes to school, because water is a major problem in many schools today. There is another way that we revived, where we found a local dam, which was built in the Muslim times, years, many years ago. And they built it so strategically, so that we revived it. This dam was collecting the rainwater and it was going into the Sambar Lake, which is the largest Indian salt lake of India. And we said, why don't we collect that dam? Why don't we collect the water there? So, we started repairing it. We built a dam. You see the yellow dot there. We built the dam in 12 months, 13 months. Over 10 million liters we collected just from that. And that 10 million liters went underground. What did it do? It revitalized all the hand pumps which were dry, all the wells which were dry, and all of them started yielding water. So because for the first time, this 8, 16 million liters of water went underground. And strategically, in 14 months, we built that dam. Over 3,000 people got jobs. Over 20 villages were benefited. Over 100,000 people had access to water through hand pumps and, and uh, wells. 106 hand pumps which are dry actually got water. 36 open wells, bars. Can you imagine that? That's where the dam was strategically located. And within 10 kilometers of that dam, the water actually reached these wells. And guess how much it cost? 18 lakhs. Can you imagine? 18 lakhs, you can build strategically a dam, which can revitalize 100 hand pumps and open wells. What we didn't learn is, this is not our, this is nothing new. This Rajasthan has been hundreds of years. We just revitalized it, brought it back into practice, brought it into mainstream. Because that dam, when we showed it to an engineer, said, not possible, forget it, it won't have any water. So we went back to the people and said, why don't we build it on our own, forget the government. So we built it on our own and now it's revitalized, increased the economy of the area. So, because we felt that technology should be demystified and decentralized, we came up with a very interesting solution. If you go to a village anywhere in the world, they are either very young people or very old people. So why don't we cash in, identify, mobilize people who are already in the village who will never leave? So we came up with this fantastic solution of training grandmothers. This is the most powerful way of communicating today. Is it telephone? Is it telegraph? Is it television? No. It's tell a woman. <laughs> tell a woman, she is the one who is going to communicate. So the, we selected the first barefoot woman solar engineer from the village, much to the opposition of the parents, and she became our woman engineer. And as a result of that, we sparked it off. And now over 164 women from all over the country are being, select, are being trained for six months. Criteria, she has to be illiterate, she has to be a grandmother, she should have never have left her village in her life, and she should have been rooted to the soil. And in six months, using sign language, not the written or spoken word, you train these women to be solar engineers. 
and to know more about solar engineering than any graduate after five years at university anywhere in the world. Challenge right now. So these women are barefoot solar engineers and they are now, we went to the poorest of the poor villages and we saw if you could train a woman from Tarkhan, why can't we train them as solar engineers? So in Tarkhan we went there, we selected the Maoist areas where no one would go, no BDO would go, no collector would go and we got the community to select some women and these barefoot grandmothers, 40 of them came no language, nothing, and they became solar engineers. लाइट लगने से क्या क्या फायदा हो रहा है फायदा है देखो लेका पड़ता है बर्तन खंगारते हैं पैसा आगुन रहता है सब को नहीं हम नहीं समझ आते हैं पर सोते हैं खाना पीना सब होता है लाइट आ क्या समझ आता है तो सब चीज के सुविधा पर गया है तो जब पहले अनहारा में रहते हैं तो हम लोग कंतीत के चूल्हा में रख जोड़ते थे ना तो कित के धरवा कर ऐसे सुदे खाकर हम सब्जी में चाहे चावल में हम लोग बना करते मेरा नाम गीता कुमारी है गांव के सरकारी स्कूल में पांचवी छठी क्लास तक पढ़ रही फिर 14 साल की उम्र में शादी हो गई तो फिर ससुराल आ गए खाना बनाना है बच्चों के देखरेख करना है घर का पूरा काम करना है घर का सफाई ये सब मेरा दो बच्चा है कुछ भी लाइट बिगड़ जाता है तो बोलते हैं इंजीनियर साहब आप बनाइए कैसे बिगड़ गया क्या हुआ आप चेक कीजिए यदि ट्रेनिंग में गए हैं सीखे हैं हमें विश्वास है तो फिर उसका रिपेयरिंग करते हैं बनाते हैं बन जाता है तो अच्छा लगता है गांव में बिजली नहीं है। बिजली सरकार मतलब कभी-कभी वैसा फंड भी आता है तो वो लोग मतलब कि पैसा खत्म कर देते हैं। बोल देते हैं कि वहाँ पॉल गरा गया फिर पॉल तक ही सीमित रह जाता है। बिजली नहीं रहने के कारण बहुत चीज का दिक्कत है बच्चे लोग को पढ़ाई लिखाई में रात में। किसी के घर में नहीं है मिट्टी तल जाते हैं। चालीस रुपए लीटर आते हैं। इसलिए उसको भी बचा के लोग जलाते हैं कि एक महीना चले वो रात भर भी जलाएंगे या ज़्यादा जलाएंगे तो वो भी खत्म हो जाएगा। औरत को ट्रेनिंग के लिए जाना हो, छह महीना का ट्रेनिंग है राजस्थान में, ठीक है? क्योंकि आप लोग की लाइट की सुविधा नहीं है, ट्रेनिंग लेके आए और सोलर लाइट्स हर घर में लगाएं जिससे कि दो लाइट जलेगा। और एक शर्त है, हमारी औरतें जो होंगी वो नई नवेली दुल्हन नहीं होनी चाहिए भाई। कहाँ माँ है भाभी है वो लोग देखेंगे आप तो उन लोग को तो छोटा छोटा बच्चा उन लोग अपना देखे ये कि इसको देखे बच्चा की जिम्मेदारी क्या छह महीने पति नहीं उठा सकते हैं ये बताइए वो तो सिस्टर ठीक कह रही है है कि नहीं है सही नहीं है बच्चा तो जितना उसका उतना ही आपका हाँ बात तो छह महीना भी हम अपनी जिम्मेदारी नहीं उठाएंगे जिससे अकेले में करने का बनता है नहीं ना पूरे गांव में लाइट रहेगा अगर गांव की औरतें नहीं जाएंगी आप कहेंगे ना तो फिर दूसरा क्यों आह
मेरा नाम सरिता देवी है हाँ का स्कूल पाँचवा तक था तो हम पढ़े हम तो दी खेती में काम करते थे हम भी हमको बारह बरस के हुए हैं बस शादी कर दें वो घर में रहते थे कहीं ना जाते थे मेरा नाम रेखा मैं तो बिल्कुल नहीं पढ़े लिखे मेरा नाम तो कालो है हमको पांच बच्चा है तब भी नहीं स्कूल गए थे परिवार वाला का मतलब जब ट्रेनिंग में शुरू में जा रहे थे तो उन लोग का फीलिंग अच्छा नहीं था ज़्यादा मतलब अपना मन से जाए थे परिवार वाला का उतना विचार न था कि मतलब छः महीना के लिए यहाँ से दूर कहीं जा तो बोला कि तुम भी जाएगा तो हमको पति कहा कि तुम कहाँ जाएगा इतना सब छोड़ छाड़ के से न मत जाओ हम कहते तो छः महीना में कहा होने जाने हैं तो हमने सोचा कि तो चल जाते हैं बनावे खाएगा ऊपर हाँ लड़की है ना तो कहीं दूर में बाप बेटी बनाना खाना रहना परिवार माना कर रहे थे ना कि हम नहीं माने कि चल गए गाँव वाला की जा रहे हैं इन लोग तो वहाँ से तो घूर के नहीं आए हाँ जब गए थे तब तो मेरा पति तो बहुत खींचाते थे जाने के लिए ना बोलते थे तो भी हम गए तो यहाँ से मेरा पति बात भी ना करते थे शुरू में जब गए तो ऐसा लगता था कि जंगल है हम लोग न रह पाएंगे यहाँ बहुत कष्ट महसूस होता था लेकिन अब मतलब फिर रहते रहते सबसे जान पहचान हो गया सबसे हंसना बोलना हंसी मजाक करना सब तो अपना भाव भंतरा मिलते हैं राम राम नमस्ते होते रहता है हर समय तो अच्छा लगता है सोलर में आते हैं हमको लगा कि कैसे सीखेंगे हमको से तो सीखना मुश्किल है चार्जर और जो लाइन पे जो सेट की सर्किट उसको जो देखे इसकी तरह से बहुत हमको हेडक आ गए थे वहाँ के एक अनपढ़ मंजिला मतलब टीचर है उनके नाम गीता है उन्होंने बोला कि टेंशन नहीं लो हम भी आपसे भी अनपढ़ थे हम है न हम सिखाए यह पी सी भी अब बन जाएगा तो सर्किट हो जाएगा सब तो अनपढ़े महिला है सब तो अनपढ़े महिला सब काम कर रहे हैं वहाँ कोई भी लोग आते थे तो गुरु जी बोलते थे डूइंग वाई लर्निंग और लर्निंग वाई डूइंग यदि हम अभ्यास करेंगे तो अभ्यास करते करते कोई भी चीज आसान मतलब हो सकता है इसी तरह से मतलब सर्किट को देख देख के हम लोग बनाते बनाते प्रयास करके सीख गए विश्वास दी हम जो चीज यहाँ सीख गए हैं वो चीज तो हम कर लेंगे अब हमें आत्मविश्वास हो गया है कि यहाँ से जाने के बाद अपना गांव में जहाँ मतलब अंधेरा है वहाँ उजाला करेंगे जो लोग बोलते थे कि वहाँ क्या करेगी क्या ना कर रही है गलत या सही उन लोग को भी मतलब कि जवाब देंगे कि हम क्या सीखने गए थे उन लोग भी देखेंगे बच्चे लोग दिन भर खेलते कूदते हैं लेकिन रात से भी दो घंटा पढ़ सकते हैं आराम से अगर एक डिब्बी चलाएगा तो सिर्फ खाना बनेगा एक लाट जलेगा तो सब बच्चा ही पड़ेगा खाना ही बनेगा अच्छा ये ये बताइए कि वो काम आप कर सकते हैं जो गीता कर रही है क्या मन में तीर से जरूर आ रहा है ईशा है <laughs> गांव वाला कभी ठीक है बोलते थे उन लोग कोई कोई कि गई है ट्रेनिंग में तो वापस नहीं आएगी उधरे रह जाएगी ऐसे करेगी इस तरह से लेकिन आने के बाद कोई कोई लोग बोलते हैं कि विश्वास नहीं था कि वापस आएगी लेकिन आ गए चिंता अच्छी था कि कौन देश जा रहा है कहाँ विदेश जा रहा है कैसे भविष्य है कहाँ चलन है कहा सुबह यही बात है काम करते हैं तो देखते हैं तो उन लोग को भी अच्छा लगता है कि सीखने गई थी वास्तव में ऐसा लगता है कि पहचान बढ़ा है लोग मान मर्यादा देते हैं इज्जत सम्मान के साथ बोलते हैं
चौवन टोटल घर यहाँ चौवन यहाँ पर मतलब पंचानवे घर में सिस्टम हम लोग लगा तो वहाँ जो कि हम लोग अंधेले में रहते थे तो अंधेला से इजोला लगता है अभी बाल बच्चों सब अच्छी तरह से कुछ पढ़ाई लिखाई की सुविधा हो रही है बच्चे को लड़ जो मिलता है तो बैठने का पढ़ने का लिखने का अधिकार अच्छी तरीके से मिल रहा है खाना सब सुरक्षित ढंग से रखने का साफ सुथरा तो बत्ती से सुविधा हुआ कि बत्ती जल रहा है ना तो हमको कॉल करो सही से बजे शाम हुआ लाइट बता दिया तो हमारा रात में क्या काज कर्म करेंगे छह बजे से लगने के बाद साढ़े नौ बजे तक काम होता है लाइट लगने से सुविधा यही है बच्चा लोग का घूमने के लिए अच्छा है पहले ना खेल पाते थे उतना रात में तो अब रात को खेलते हैं अंधेरा रहता था तो आखिरी बिबरी का डर रहता था बिच्छू निकल जाता था जो काम रात में ना करते थे वो काम अब रात में कर लेते हैं बनाते हैं टाइम से खाना खाते हैं चावल चून लेते हैं और सब्जी उब्जी रात में काट लेते हैं अब टाइम से सब चीज न करते हैं हम सब तेरी ऐसे बाहर नहीं सर हमको तो वरदान पढ़ा लिखे हम बने मान हम से चुके हैं इस तो बहनों मेरी प्रणाम कल है मुखिया से मिली उसी रोजगार योजना के बारे में कुछ उन्हें बताएं कि परमानी रोजगार गारंटी गारंटी योजना पहले लैम जलाते थे किरास अंदर डाल के और कभी कभी तेल मिलता भी नहीं था तो दिक्कत हम लोगों को था डीजल जलाना पड़ता था महिला का प्राथमिकता इसलिए दिया गया है कि मान लिया घर में अगर घुस रही है तो महिला घर में रहती है तो भी झिझक घर में घुसेगी जो भी काम है कब अपने तक निकल जाए निकल जाएगी तो बढ़िया है अगर सोलर कुछ हो भी आता है तो पूरा रिक्शा में ऊपर है और जो भी पचास रुपया महीना लग रहा है हम लोग लोग देंगे हम लोग देंगे देंगे साथ साथ दिलाएंगे भी अगर कोई नहीं देते तो उनसे दिलाने का भी कोशिश करेंगे हाँ हाँ महिला है गई तो हमारे लिए तो और भी सुविधा है जब भी कुछ हो जाती है उनको बुला करके देखभाल करवा लें अब खाली सर्किट है तो उसको बना लेंगे अब किसी का बिगड़ गया तो उसको टेस्टिंग करना है कि क्या कहाँ पर क्या अच्छी खराब है क्या सारा चीज कर रही है ये बताओ यहाँ पे जो आमदनी हो रही है उससे तुमको क्या फायदा होता है जैसे अपना बच्चा का ड्रेस सिलवाना है तो अभी अपने से खरीद के ड्रेस सिलवा अपने से खरीद के तो कैसा लग रहा है तुमको अच्छा लग रहा है कि हम यदि अपना काम करेंगे खुद मेहनत करेंगे तो हम अपना बच्चा के लिए किसी के आश्रित न रहेंगे पहले से अच्छा लग रहा है कि कुछ काम करने के लिए सीख गए तो इतना हिम्मत है कि कहीं पर भी दो पैसा काम करके हम लोग खा सकते अब तो विश्वास हो गया तो कहीं पर भी किसी के जाने के रहेगा तो कोई भी कितना हमको रस्मे बांधेगा तो तुम नहीं ये डरते थे किसी से बात करने में तो अब डर ना रहा न रहा अब अचानक बात करते हैं कोई भी रहता है उससे पहली दफा अपनी नौकरी में एनजीओ के काम देखे हैं पिछले कई वर्षों में और बहुत सारे विकास के कार्य भी देखे हैं एक ऐसा गांव जो कि गांव वासियों द्वारा ही और गांव वासियों में भी महिलाओं के द्वारा सौर ऊर्जा से ऊर्जान्वित गांव मैंने पहली दफा देखा है
They are the first financially and technically self-sufficient solar electrified villages in Bihar. <coughs> we took this technology to Ladakh and 50 villages have been solar electrified by women in Ladakh. And we went, when, when we went to this house in Ladakh and we asked this lady, what is the benefit of solar energy that she received? And she thought for a minute and said, it's the first time I can see my husband's face in winter. Can you imagine, minus 40 outside and only with a candlelight for six months? Unacceptable for them. So, we have solar electrified villages in Rajasthan, <coughs> up in the cold deserts of Ladakh, and all have been done by women engineers, and as a result of more light being prepared, they have more time to do some work on handicrafts and increase the income. So today, this is what we did for solar electrifying villages all over India. With this technology, we thought we'd go to Africa. Rural women, sorry, rural women today are being trained in Rajasthan to make solar water heaters and solar cookers. And this is the way of generating income today in Philonia. With this technology, we went to, the, to Africa. And we went to the government of India and said, we want to solar electrify villages in Africa. So we have an extraordinary arrangement with the government of India. But should I select any woman from the continent of Africa, the government of India will give me the airfare and six months training cost to bring them to the Barefoot College. So today, this is the lighting that they use in Africa, called by many names. They spend over 10 kilometers to get five liters of kerosene. So what is the barefoot approach? The barefoot approach is to bring the whole community together and ask them how much they spend on lighting, candles, stove batteries, and diesel. And they say about $10. We said, all right, are you prepared to give $10 for solar lighting, what you already spent? They said, yes, not a problem for me. So then we call the whole village together and decide on a committee and how much does every house get Every house gets a 40 watt panel, three LED lights, one solar lantern, and it costs 400 pounds. They form this committee, collect the contribution, and then they have to select a grandmother. That is the biggest surprise. Has to be literate, has to have a village in her life, and the grandmothers in Africa are usually at the age of 35 year old grandmother, so just the right age for them to find. Community is pressured to select the grandmother. And today, the best solar engineers are grandmothers. Today, they come, there are 40 of them in one place, all sitting together at one table, all learning how to be solar engineers, all talking to each other but not understanding a word because they all speak in French, Jola, uh, Spanish, and, um, but the body language is great. And they all learn slowly in six months to be solar engineers. <laughs> They are already solar engineers, but they are also entrepreneurs. So they learn how to make sanitary pad napkins, right there, while they are there for six months. They learn how to make chalk and candles, while they are there for six months. They learn how to make teaching aids and learning aids at night school, that they want to go back. So they are already entrepreneurs. They learn how to make mosquito nets. They learn how to make new solar cookers. So also, when they have spare time, they also do yoga. They have yoga classes every day. So very productive and they become a pawn and they become a larger family. So I'm going to show you a very short film. This is a true story about ordinary heroes. This is about very simple rural women in Africa, from Ethiopia to Gambia, from Mauritania to Tanzania, from Sudan to South Africa. 
a quiet revolution is taking place. Illiterate and semi-literate rural women, most of them grandmothers, who have never left their villages in their lives are proving the impossible is possible. By the hands-on approach, they are baffling high-powered engineers, universities, donors, development planners and paper-qualified experts by demonstrating incredible sophisticated technology skills and exposing the fundamental inadequacies of the rigid theoretical formal educational system. Without using the written or spoken word, they have come to India to be trained in six months to be solar engineers through the use of the sight and sound, unlike the universities and other urban-based training courses that are all theory and no practice. It is not surprising these women know more about practical installation, fabrication, repair and maintenance than any paper-qualified certified solar engineer in any university or engineering college in Africa or India after five years. After six months in India, using only sign language while training, they know no theories of physics, electronics, mathematics. All the women sitting together on one table learn how to assemble charge controllers and inverters, how to establish a rural electronic workshop in small rooms donated by the community, install solar panels on the roofs, connect them to deep cycle batteries. In 2011, the president of Sierra Leone has constructed the first barefoot training center in Contaline in Africa, where now these 12 barefoot women solar engineers will train 150 grandmothers from all over the country. Poor communities in all these countries in Africa have agreed to pay what they now pay for kerosene, candles, wood, torch batteries and diesel. Depending on their economic status, they have agreed to pay between $5 to $10 a month per solar unit. This is a fundamental breakthrough because nothing should be free. 214 solar grandmothers has of today solar electrified 13,000 houses in 186 villages. The first technically and financially self-sufficient solar electrified villages in the whole continent of Africa, indeed the world. On a rare visit to the Barefoot College, when he also spent the night, His Holiness the Dalai Lama blessed the women solar engineers on the 13th of February 2011. That's secret, that's secret. So those illiterate, illiterate uh, villagers, even grandmother, you see, physically also a little bit old and illiteracy, illiterate. Yet, see, through training, as an engineer, Proud, self confidence and dignity. Wonderful. By 2013, by including Liberia, South Africa, Southern Sudan, Zimbabwe, Burundi, Zanzibar, almost all the countries in the continent of Africa will have been covered, saving 1.5 million liters of kerosene from polluting the environment and thousands of tons of wood from being cut, depleting the already fragile forest. The Indian government has approved the proposal to establish five barefoot training centers. Solar electrify an additional 11,000 houses in 200 more villages spread over the whole continent of Africa. Speaking in Tinjamba and there's a light of India. We're very happy tonight because it was very, very dark in Tinjamba before. There is no question. The barefoot approach is here to stay. What Mahatma Gandhi said comes to mind. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. continent of Africa. All the men have left, all the men have gone abroad, all the men are living in cities, not one has come back. So these are the first and only women solar engineers of Africa. Today we have spread the barefoot approach all over the world. We've gone to the Pacific, which is a 
trained 20 grandmothers in the Pacific. And now, through the courses that we have conducted for the government of India, we have gone to 12 courses now, and these women have been trained in six months in these countries, in 62 countries. The barefoot approach also believes in partnership. So the government looks after the software, and the hardware is looked after by foundations, by United Nations, by government of India, by private foundations. All of them actually donate for the money. So there is a partnership subsidized model at work, and we don't, regrettably, believe in a business model. Business model is too heartless. It is only give and take and, and buying and selling, and then the relationship is over. We want the relationship to continue. It has to be something which is human, compassionate, equal. So we have NL Green Power, who have done work in South America, and we have done with $500,000. They've given us some money to solar electrify 1,000 houses. And we've done it in Peru, we've done it in Chile. One of our greatest supporters has been Michelle Bachelet, who was head of UN Women, now she's president of Chile. So the Barefoot College, when this the Lai Lama came for it. He saw what both we were doing. And he had something very profound to say. He made a puppet of it as well. <laughs> he had something very profound to say. He said, now that you've shown the Barefoot College working in practice, let's see if the experts and the professor can make it work in theory. <laughs> we are doing everything wrong. <coughs> And somehow the impact is still being felt. This is something which I think is the only solution <coughs> today. How do you empower women to be engineers to change their life? Patient from the clinicians. I am rich and well born. <coughs> Who else is equal to me? I will sacrifice, I will give. In that I shall rejoice. Thank you. following you actually for many years and I'm very like, happy to be here. Um, I have a question uh, regarding when you're teaching these women, are they ever curious about what's going on uh, inside the lamp to make it light? Like, do they ever have any science curiosity as to how is it working in the first place? Or is, um, yeah, like, no. So they never ever ask, why is this lighting? Where is this current? Month That's after month. They are taught how to put it together. Yeah. They don't ask why and what this is all about. They don't want the thread. They just want practice. No, like is there like one out of a thousand women who are curious about what's going on at the science level? But we did challenge some countries, the heads of uh, the electronic and solar engineering uh, uh, gov uh, government. And we said, look, there are 20 parts of the solar lantern on this table, and 20 parts of the solar lantern on this table. And get your head of the engineer of your solar department with double PhDs from Stanford to put this lantern together, and I'll get my grandmother on this side. And let's see if we can put it. Most of them said, no, I won't risk it. They won't do it. Well, the grandmother did it in half an hour. So what do we prove? Who do we want? Do you want this guy pushing paper? Or do you want the grandmother so that like find villages? <laughs> now the question is now, number one, being a man still, how can I con how can I work for this, this this movement? Number two, are besides making and assembling those things. Are you also having some kind of R&D, some kind of a, uh, a, a new innovations over there? So that it increases, number one, the capacity of the solar cells, and number two, increases the capacity of the, uh, the storage, means the, the batteries. And how to make it cost effective? Two things, sir. Thank you. The Ministry of New and Renewable Energy have entered into a long-term agreement with us to train 40 grandmothers from Indian states all over the country. 
and wherever there are strong NGOs, we ask them to select non-electrified villages and go through the process of selecting the grandmother to send them to the Barefoot College. Where there are very traditional societies in Bihar, we actually first ask the community leaders to visit the college first to see where the women are staying. And that gives them enough uh, comfort that it's secure in places like that. And then the women come. And we have now trained over 40 women from Bihar, from Jharkhand, from Bihar, from Bodh Gaya, from uh, West Tibetia, from Champaran district. And they are coming slowly. And now there is the national solar mission where we can have access to the equipment as well. So it is moving slowly in the right direction. But we feel that repair and maintenance should be the responsibility of the community and not an engineer 60 miles away who never comes. And I think this is not the way to proceed. So when you see them walking 10 kilometers for 5 liters of kerosene and you give them a solar light which is so bright that they can see and read and write, it is already a cost effective operation. If you commute, if you look at the calculation of how much they spend going there, how light, how the light is very dim and it's not, uh, not, it's not bright enough, and they have health problems, eye problems. So I think the the solar units that are already available today. I remember it was um, it was when we first started solar. It was one rupee, one hundred and sixty-five rupees a watt. Now it has come down to thirty rupees a watt today. So it's accessible to the very poorest of the poor, but they can't afford to give the hardware cost. That has to be done by the owner. And I see no harm in subsidy. We are subsidizing the rich everywhere, but when it comes to subsidizing the poor, we want them to be sustainable. That's not fair. You remove the subsidies everywhere, you have no problem. But you can't have two rules here. So we believe in subsidy, because that is the only way you can get to the very poor people who we are talking about who can't afford $400, and I think they have every right to give them life, they have a right to bring that. So technology is there, accessibility is there, women are absolutely extraordinary, women situation all wrong. So come, if you want to help, go to your ancestral village which has no electricity, I'm sure, even if there are power lines, and, yeah. you, yes. and you let us know which is your village, and we'll get some two women there on condition that you give the money for the equipment. <laughs> Done. Not a problem. Uh, about innovations also, you're doing something? Yeah, the innovations is const constantly, the charge control is being changed all the time. Now we have led, I mean, now we have LED lights instead of CFL lamps. All these technologies and innovation is taking time. But we don't want to be too innovative. We want them to actually do the repair and maintenance on their own rather than depend on anyone from outside. So. We are introducing that much technology that they can repair and maintain and be self-sufficient. This has been an outstanding, exciting uh, presentation, really. It's, I don't think we've even been, we were even aware, I wasn't certainly. <coughs> empowerment, women empowerment, social transformation, you know, is it's fantastic. I just wondered if you had any uh, plans for scaling this effort or is there any idea for perhaps building another college or replicating the model, the training model in different parts of the country so that you know there can be a larger footprint or wider reach to villages that might want it, might want to receive the training. And there's probably only that much you can do in Tilonia. What we do when we first started Barefoot College in 1974 was to encourage young boys and girls from different parts of the country to come and stay at the college. They didn't want to be a collector, they didn't want to follow their parents, they didn't want to be a doctor, lawyer, they wanted to work with communities and they wanted to come and see how they could actually learn something about how to start an NGO, how to run an NGO, how to manage an NGO. So they, take that, they took their time and they also came to the conclusion that they want to be a bunker royal, which is great. So after six months or one year, depending on how much time it took for them to be confident about what they had picked up from the Barefoot College, we asked them to go back to the state they came from. So now there are 23 Barefoot Colleges in 13 states of India.
there are certain conditions. You can't call it barefoot. You have to register separately. You have to have your own board. You have to raise your own money. And you have to have your own identity. But nowadays when I hear someone saying, Oh, have you heard of this organization in Orissa? I'm so pleased when they know it's not because I started it. <laughs> and it's on their own. So they have their own identity, they have their own stature. Now, we have got together and formed a group of Sampada. And Sampada are these 23 organizations in 13 states of India. We've gone to Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is going to solar rectify those 20 um, infrastructure which has been built for Kenya in all these states. And they are going to solar rectify 2,000 houses. So 40 women from those very five states of Kerala, Uttarakhand, Rajasthan, Bihar. So the scaling up is taking place already. Tarkhan, Gujarat, already in Telonia right now to be trained as solar engineers. They go back and solar rectify. Now the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy has said, no problem, we'll give you money for three years. Train as many women as you want. So this is where public-private partnership works with us. We go to private foundations and the CSR to give us the money for the equipment. The government of India gives the money for the training and the and the stipend. So it works. Sorry, can I ask how do you arrive in that six month? What is what happens in that six months? Why six months? You know, all these women who have come from either India or abroad are actually dragged onto the plane screaming. They hate the idea of leaving their grandchildren, hate the idea of leaving their house. So the first month is a period of adjustment. First month is always the largest bills we have is mobile bills. What am I doing here? Why have you sent me here? Waste of time. I don't know how to eat and ride. Who are these people? I can't eat the food here. First month. First, second month is always a period of adjustment. I can't speak my language. So it's always very difficult. Second, third, fourth month is the productive month because that is when they start learning and they see other people just like them around them who don't know how to read and write. So they feel a bit more comfortable. They're not, they don't stand out. And when they hear the trainer is also illiterate, then they feel even better. <laughs> so an illiterate trainer, training an illiterate trainee, you couldn't have a better combination. And the best part of being illiterate is that you don't forget. So even after six months, when the recruitment takes time, they know. I remember a minister asking these women, Arya, but you are so illiterate, you will you forget? She snapped at him and said, I will never forget. Six months I've been doing nothing but making charge controls, I can make one blindfolded for you. <laughs> so that is the best part of bringing these women up and making them stories. Whenever we select people from Africa and we have the whole village around, husband said, okay, you go to India, I'll get myself another wife, I can't wait for six months. In spite of all that pressure, in spite of that threat, all these women come to the Western country. And they all learn because they know they are the only solar engineers of that country and they are under pressure to prove that they can do it. They go back and solar electrify the first village ever in their country and the husband is so awed by the situation, he says, please come back. You know, I can't even... So I tell everyone when I go to these countries, this is the last time you're going to see a woman like this together because she's going like a grandmother but coming back like a tiger. And you won't be able to stop her. Because she's on 100 miles. When I went to Burkina Faso, I had the same problem. Oh, you go, come back, I'm going to have another. He went, came back, solar electrified the whole building. Husband says, come back. Wife said, no, I'm all right. Thank you very much. I'm all right, independent, free, freedom. I don't want you as my, as my husband. And so it depends how, how it actually affects them. So not one failure. 600 grandmothers in 64 countries, not one failure. We had, a, we had two grandmothers from Benin who, who we, we went back home and I get a telegram from the NGO saying, look, they've forgotten everything. 
and the ministry is supposed to inaugurate in one month. Must have happened, those men must have got to them saying, what is the name of this park, you know about this, you know the same question, what is the process, so they got into a coma and they said, I forgot them. <laughs> in that same course where they were from, there was a battle axe of a grandmother from Mauritania. I flew her in 24 hours from Mauritania to Benin. And as soon as these two women saw this battle axe, they remembered everything. <laughs> and they solar electrified the first village ever of Benin. Stories like this are extraordinary. But never have there been a failure. Good evening, sir. My name is Sachin. Thank you for uh, sharing this fantastic live journey. In fact, I would like to thank India Culture Lab for facilitating this. I have uh, two questions, uh, one more at an individual level. What kept you going for so many years? What was that spark, that fire, that inspiration that kept you going? And the other side of the coin, were there any episodes or incidents you'd like to share that almost deterred you or you know, almost made you give up uh, and say, no, this is not worth it, this is not happening, the obstacles are too much, that would be great. That's the first part of the question. The second is, do you see this model being scaled to or applied to mass manufacturing or SMEs in villages in India where factories can be put up and similar model applied to create smaller factories and hypothetically Godrej wanted to assemble refrigerators and air conditioners on the Tilonia model. Do you think that lends itself in some shape and form? So these are my two questions. Hidden agenda of coming to this is to take some choto foods to these countries. <laughs> so they are going to make, we are going to make sure that some of these choto foods actually arrive in these 64 countries because I think this would be a fantastic input for them. They actually get a lot of money from the government of India. They get 25,000 rupees per month as a <coughs> stipend from the government of India. So there's, they have a lot of money to take back home. So now they can buy these choto foods and take it home with the money they have. And they take back a thousand dollars in cash so that they know that they're not going empty-handed. So this has been a very good program. What keeps me going? When I'm in Delhi, I usually introduce myself as Anura Roy's husband. I don't know if it works in Bombay, but it does? Okay. So I'm Aruna Roy's husband, so that keeps me going. Whenever I, I get into a... So we are... Uh, Married for 50, for 44 years, and we fight every day <laughs> for everything, but it works. What really keeps me going? See a non-person, a depressed, deprived, demoralized, marginalized grandmother coming to you, and in six months she becomes, in front of your eyes, someone who is cocky, gutsy, willing to change the world, willing to talk to anybody. You see this miraculous change happening in front of your eyes, keeps me going. You can't you have a better, better way of charging yourself up by seeing something happening in front of you and knowing that it will make such a great difference to their country back home. So that keeps me going. I, I haven't really felt depressed because there are so many things happening in Colonia which makes you feel that is, where the, that is where the heart of India is, you know, in Bharat. You will get demoralized and depressed when you go to Delhi because nothing is happening there. When you see something happening in front of you, the change taking place, the gutsy teacher, the gutsy guy, everyone working for the good of the community, it charges you up. That's where the solution lies for India, not Delhi, Mumbai. That's where it lies. I've always felt that if you have, if you're a good listener, you can pick up so many ideas that you'll never get in school and college today. That is where you, you have to go through an unlearning process. My real education started when I went to these people, when I went to the school and college. This is where you learn much more about what's happening in reality. Uh, hi, I just wanted to ask, uh, we saw a lot about solar technology in the videos and from what you said. I was just wondering about the other social challenges that we might be able to tackle through this approach, such as maybe uh, like toilets in India, for example. So I just wanted to know what direction you would look at. The slide was very fast, but we are actually collecting rainwater in most of the schools we are working in. So we got rainwater. Harvesting structures. The rainwater harvesting structures that you have are not overground. 
<coughs> this underground because that's how the people collect more rainwater. It's not the simplest tanks which you have on top, which only collects five to ten thousand liters. It's underground where you can collect a hundred thousand liters, and that water is used for toilets. Usually, you make toilets and there's no water, so usually they don't work very well. So the toilets are linked to the rainwater harvesting that we do. So most of the schools have <coughs> toilets constructed with the rainwater harvesting tank. Sorry, just to interrupt. Yeah. Just to interrupt you, but um, things like compost toilets technology that don't use water, wouldn't they be a more efficient use of the water? Uh, the compost toilets is uh, going to be a cultural problem because the compost toilets you have to clean after six months and use it as a uh, fertilizer and that whole area of carrying night soil on air that you want to get rid of confuses people about these compost toilets. So we're not using compost toilets because we find it's a cultural problem here. They won't use it, they won't feel clean. It. And, and, and there are some technology problems there. But anyway, come to Tilonia because we have a compost toilet that works in Tilonia. So you're welcome to come. And if you want to chip it, be a volunteer, not a problem. We're going to finish one question from there and then come to that side. Uh, firstly, congratulations. It's a wonderful job that you have done. I don't understand the criteria of filtering out the ignition at your destination. Like you say that uh, she should be rooted in the village. She should not have uh, moved out within months. So what are the logic behind those filtration or that? Uh, and how close are you restricting those things? As I said before, we have come to the conclusion that men are untrainable. <laughs> men are restless, men are compulsively mobile, and they all want a certificate. And the moment you give a man a certificate in a village, he leaves the village within hours looking for a job in the city. So the logic of going to a grandmother is because that skill that you train her in remains in the village and is not lost. You don't lose it outside. So wherever people are doing training programs and training men from villages, they are not going to stay. No chance. So why not train a woman instead? Because if you train a man, he gets threatened, he will not train someone else. If you train a woman, she loves training someone else to take her place. So all the women that we've trained are immediately training someone else in the village because they don't want that village, that skill to be lost. You know, it's the psyche of the woman. It's the psyche of the man not to share the skill. It's the psyche of the woman to share. So we are working on that psyche and making sure that the skill remains in the village and not go up. You know, Mark Twain said, never let school interfere with your education. <laughs> school is what you learn how to read and write. Education is what you get from your family, from your environment, and from your community. And I think this education that we are talking about, of a new alternative education that the barefoot model is proposing, is the future today. We must not, where is it written that just because you can't read and write, you can't become a dentist, or a doctor, or a teacher, or a, or a water, or a solar engineer, where is it written? We have got this mindset problem here about education that we have to get out of, out of the box. I'll answer your question a bit more. We are not, we are only seeing the situation as it exists. And the situation as it exists in the village is that the woman doesn't go out. We don't force her to stay in that village. But she will not go out because she thinks it's a job to get money and send it to her. So it's the woman who stays. If the woman stays, why not train her to be a solar engineer? So if she stays there, doesn't go out. And because we don't give any certificates after training, he stays there. You know, certification is one major incentive to encourage people to migrate. When we don't give a certificate, even if she's the best solar engineer, she'll never get a job in the city because the first stupid question everyone asks is, what is your qualification? <laughs> you know? She hasn't got a qualification. She hasn't got any paper. But she solar electrified the whole village for you. Why do I need a paper on the wall for that? You know what I mean? 
So we're trying to change mindset here. How do we do that? Uh, good evening. I'm glad I got this opportunity because I've like been following you, following you since like the seventh grade, and uh, and uh, okay. <laughs> so um, during the course of the presentation, when the path leading to Ladakh came, I was just wondering that snow snow will collect on the solar panels during the winter season. So. How do you manage to electrify the village and get enough solar energy for that? We calculate the height of the solar of the snow on the roof and then we raise the panel just above the snow line. Okay, that's simple. And most of the people in Ladakh actually come out of their house from the roof because all the snow around is blocked the houses. So the only way to come out is through the roof. So if you have the solar panel about four or four feet above the, source of the snow line, then the light will shine. Answer your question. Hi, Walker. My name is Vishal Tadevi, and I work for a company called Snow Water Development Partners. Uh, we are active in Myanmar, and I'm working on a pre coastal project at the moment. Uh, apart from that, it's, it's a carbon finance project, I believe. Apart from that, I'm also working on a microwave uh, concept development in Myanmar. That's at Orbis. Uh, I'm currently based in Mumbai and I'm working on a startup plan. For a person like me who has got no access to the government or the CSR funding or whatsoever, I'm putting my power equity in the startup. I remember you mentioned that the business model approach is something which you would not uh, support or you know, publicate. I want to understand what kind of approach should I go forward with when I'm putting my own money. Uh, for the same purpose, uh, is electrifying uh, the rural and the urban BOP segment. How much time are you prepared to get to this project? Uh, it's part time uh, thing for me. I, I, Seventy percent of my time goes for all this. It's my full time job. I take out thirty percent of my time for this part of uh, this small job. Take some time off okay. and come to the Barefoot College. I would love to. And meet some people there okay. who are exactly in the same predicament as you are. Okay. And I always suggest that you come to the Barefoot College and spend some time with them and interact with them. Clear your mind with some sort of misconceptions people have how to go forward. It's always very good to interact with lots of different types of people from different backgrounds because you get an insight as a result of the interaction. So when you have time, let me know and you come. And the best time you come is when I'm not there. Yeah. But then everything works and everyone's relaxed. Everyone, everyone tells me that when I'm there, everyone gets tense. So please come when you can. Thank you. And spend some time. And then I think you, the way forward will be very clear to you. And if you want to be a part of the whole barefoot process, not a problem. <coughs> Even in Myanmar, we have six women from Myanmar who so I electrify the village. Yeah, I saw the Myanmar things uh, one of the yes. uh, I'll talk to you about that later. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you made a very interesting distinction uh, right at the beginning and through the presentation between literacy and education. Now, uh, a topic that fascinates me is the digital divide. And on the digital divide, uh, for the illiterate, there is no entry, as far as I can see. Is there a barefoot approach to overcoming the digital divide? In eight, 1981, we won a Supreme Court case called Sanjeev Troy versus Government of Rajasthan on minimum wages. It was a historic judgment of the Supreme Court in how minimum wage should be paid to all workers, men and women, under drought conditions. The person who was behind that was a lady called Norti. And she is a fiery leader who commanded so much respect and got 5,000 people together to agitate why they were not getting minimum wages. And she won this case in the Supreme Court because she had the guts and the gall to go behind everyone and push her way through and make this judgment happen. She was exhausted. She came to me and said, I'm, I want to do something else. So I said, um, why don't you sit on a computer? She said, you didn't hear me, I'm illiterate. I said, I heard you, sit on a computer. Six months later, she comes to me and says, I can make you a spreadsheet. I said, make me a spreadsheet. And she 
one finger, he didn't know how to read and write, but to one finger to read a spreadsheet. I said, I'm willing to talk about this to other people. He talks to 5,000 people, he said, okay, I talk. So he went to Bangalore. Azim Penji, Chief Minister of Bangalore, Ajit Patricharya, President Street, and Norti. And 300 whiz kids from, back, from Silicon Valley came back to Bangalore. And she started a presentation. She got a standing ovation for three minutes because they couldn't understand how this illiterate woman could use the computer with such, such dexterity. And she said, illiteracy is a what? Never underestimate an illiterate woman anywhere in the world. She has the power to do miracles. It's our mind which is bogged up. And we think that this woman can't do it. So she is now training other women under Narega how to fill in data so that there is no corruption. And she is the Sarpanch now of the village of Kumara. Success story, but there are many such women today who are not using illiteracy as a barrier to digital knowledge. So I think this is a great hope. Why are we penalizing people just because they can't read and write? They've got so much to give, so much to offer. Look at the bright side, look at the strong side. Illiteracy so what? Why are we making this a big thing? Sorry, I'm not going to be called anywhere in the university. I don't take any I don't speak in university because they think I'm corrupting their minds. But actually, this is common sense. There's no other choice. If the man is a woman is illiterate, why not use the knowledge, skills, wisdom that they have for the development of their own communities? But when the grandmothers went back, all the 600 grandmothers said, now I want to learn how to read and write. Good. Take two last and then I'll do the privilege of the last question. Uh, hi, sir. My name is Sukriti. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, I wanted to ask you. Actually, I haven't been following me, have you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> a little bit online. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask you for those of us who work in a social space, uh, what has been your. It's actually two questions. The first one what is your personal greatest, I guess for lack of a better word, asset or something that has helped you achieve your goal, something that you would attribute you know, 30 or 30 years or 40 years towards this uh, life goal is a strong commitment. And so something that maybe you achieve, uh, I think personally, that you hold. And the second part of my question is, you know, since India is expanding and more people are moving away from the rural to the urban, how do you think we can tackle the issues of sustainability in the urban environment in the way, in a sort of barefoot approach? Because unlearning and relearning is basically what you have to do, even in your own mindset, to tackle sustainability. So, what do you do? You have any hope for the people living in the cities in that way? <laughs> Wherever we have stone electrified in villages in Africa, and they have heard villages which have been electrified. <coughs> We have found people moving back from the city to the village. So there has been reverse migration in Africa because quality of life has improved because of villages where they came from. And they've gone back and started small shops and businesses. So solar electrification has become a very powerful tool to reverse migration. The second thing we do to make sure that they don't migrate is you don't give certificates. You don't know how important it is in the mindsets of very, of very rural people that they have to have a certificate in the hand to show that they are qualified to get a job. Even if they are unemployable, they want that paper in their hand. So we say no paper. You provide your skill to your community. You stay in the community. And maybe, maybe a university might come and give you a certificate because of the work you do, but not the graduate college. So, they don't want to loan, so why do they want to serve it? In, in Afghanistan, when this woman went and solar electrified the first village ever in Afghanistan, she went and sat with the men. And the men said, what do you think you're doing? You should be sitting one kilometer away with those women there. This, this is where the men sit. So she said, today I'm not a woman, I'm an engineer. 
and have every right to sit next to me. And for the first time it hit them in the eye. By God, she has sold her liquefied out village. She has every right to sit. She did it quietly, and she said, no. No doom dam, no foom farm, no. She just went quietly sat. And it changed the mindset of people just by setting an example. So I think if you improve the quality of life of villages, no one in his right mind would like to go to a slum in Mumbai. So why aren't we improving the quality of life, water, electricity, employment? Why are we making plastic shoes in Mumbai? Because people who are working on leather in villages are starved of a market. Why are we doing that? Weavers are out of a job because you're giving them cheap cloth. Leather workers are out of a job because they're giving cheap plastic shoes. All these people who are fantastic artisans are losing their job because you are bringing cheap stuff from urban to rural. You have to stop that. You have to give them dignity, not make them beggars. You are losing half your skills because most of them are migrating from rural to urban. Most of these are fantastic weavers, losing their skills because they have no job. <coughs> so we have to be more sensible, a bit more humane, a bit more compassionate. You don't have that enough. And that you don't learn in school and college. You go and live with them and you see how much of a difference it makes to you. Good evening, sir. You have done a wonderful job in 12 states of India, but what about the rest? Uh, for example, uh, say I belong to Haryana. Uh, people call that Haryana Punjab are the states, but actually the reality is a uh, few villages in Haryana Punjab also they are love lights. And if you go to like Madhya Pradesh, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, there are many villages. Uh, we are going abroad, we are helping African uh, and American countries, but still if we are bad in our state, in our country, then why should we be looking for ourselves first? In my past life, I was an advisor in the planning commission. Um, Mr. Rajiv Gandhi went to school with me, so when he became prime minister, he said, come and help me in the planning commission. So I did. I said, I'll take one rupee a month only, but I'll help you. So I wrote up a policy statement for the first time for voluntary agencies for the planning commission, seventh plan. And of course, the deputy chairman who I now used to be Manmohan Singh, he threw it out. He said, what is this thing you're writing for civil society? This is a government of India document and you're writing. So fortunately at that time I was uh, having dinner with him, with Rajiv Gandhi, and I said, Mr. Gandhi, I have a problem with your planning commission. He said, what's happened? He said, I've written these four pages and no one is accepting them. He said, why? I said, yeah. show it to me. So I showed it to him, he said, it looks all right. So I said, he said, who should I speak to? I said, speak to the man on the other side of the table who happened to be Manmohan Singh. So he said, what's wrong with Mr. Roy Spector? He said, you right. So he said, if you say so, sir, we will accept it. He said, yes, I say so. <laughs> so the whole planning commission had to stop the seventh plan paper and they had to include the four pages I wrote in the rural development chapter. And in that chapter I wrote that civil society has every right to have access to government money because that's my money. I want to see money better spent. So I want to see that I have to have access to that money. Even if you give me a very small amount, I want to have access to that money, which they did eventually accept. But in all the so-called progressive states, there was no civil society. Haryana, Punjab, no civil society. I'm very old now, but in 1974 when I met Mrs. Gandhi, Senior Gandhi, she said, what do you want me to do to promote the barefoot party? I said, would you like to write to all the chief ministers of that state to see that we can do some civil society work? Zail Singh was then chief minister of Punjab and had Bansilal was the chief minister of Haryana. Bansilal within 24 hours called me and said, here's the whole cabinet, here's the secretariat, here's the minister, now we're going to do. Benji has written me a letter, now I'll talk to So I said, okay, I'll start something. And we started. But Jain Singh didn't even reply. The concept of civil society work in so-called progressive states is zero. It's only in the backward states of this country that you might have some civil society work going on. So I need to piggyback on civil society work that is already being done in that state. 
So if you're asking me why have I got to Punjab and Haryana, I haven't got an organization that is working there, which is credible, which has a track record. Why am I in Bihar? Why am I in Uttarakhand? Because there are civil society organizations there. Which is so if you're asking me why have I gone to other states, because I haven't got a good, credible NGO that I can work with. Answer? If I can ask the last, it's what you touched upon earlier, it's you and Aruna. What does it mean like, or can you just share with us some of it, what it means to be part of such a creative partnership, how your work uh, influences each other. Has she, for example, has she, you know, have you helped her with all her work on RTI? How does she work with Barefoot? And I mean, and on a more personal side, when two creative change agents are living together, tell us about some of the, 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 the fireworks as well. <laughs> the secret <laughs> is that we have been married for 44 years and in those 44 years we have never spent one month together. <laughs> so our marriage starts at 44 because now we've done all our what we're supposed to do and now we can relax. So. If you have a partner who is possessive, who wants to be close to you, and you want to do things which uh, uh, don't make a difference, then you have to be able to follow your dream. And I followed my dream, and Aruna is following her dream, and we do help each other, definitely. But we don't work on the same. She is more vocal. She is more open, she loves talking to thousands of people. I'm a bit of a hermit, I stay quiet, I stay back. And I say that the organization must produce. I shouldn't be king, but I can be king maker. And I would like to have more people from the organization grow and take my place in my lifetime and not be in the forefront. Thank you. 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 Thank you.